Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Matt, as you know, from the zoology group at Grand Rapids Community College. And you are from fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, if I remember correctly, at Stepping Stones Montessori here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So we're here today to present a new series with uh, Ricky Oldenkamp, one of my students over here, and she will be helping us with the butterflies and moss that we'll be looking at today. The new series that we're gonna have is called Biodiversity Boutiques. So you've heard of biodiversity before, right? That's the study of virtually everything in the biological world. So we are gonna have shows about the chemistry of life, the physics of life, microbiology, anatomy and physiology of humans, and today we're gonna to have butterflies and moths. So we're calling it boutiques because a boutique, anybody know what a boutique is? It's a specialty store, or a specialty bank, or just a specialty. So we are all specialists. In other words, I probably shouldn't teach too much in the way of botany because I don't think I'm a specialist, but I do know something about butterflies and moths. Now, do you guys think that I know everything about butterflies and moths? No. Are you guys supposed to say yes? But it's no? I don't think so either, right? So today we're going to learn some things about butterflies and moths, our first boutique. And then in future shows, we're going to have trips to Meyer Garden soon because the Frederick Meyer Garden has the Butterflies Are Blooming exhibit very, very soon. And then we'll have field trips to Amon Park or Pierce Cedar Creek Institute, as well as people from the chemistry department giving us talks and physics department. So it's, it's, it's going to be a really good education. I think it'll be a lot of fun. So first of all, since we're doing butterflies and moss today, we probably should look at their life cycle really quickly, right? And I'll just have a few slides, and I'll just go through the life cycles. You probably know what they are. Does anybody remember what they are offhand? Who knows? Doesn't it go egg, and then caterpillar or larva, then pupa, and then it becomes the butterfly? Very good. And do moths do the same thing? I'm not sure. Anybody know? Well, that's the weird thing, because they both belong to this big, gigantic order called Lepidoptera. Lepidoptera means scaly wings. So these guys have scales on their wings, little tiny shingles. Each one is one color only. But they both grow, go through the same stages that you talked about, the egg, the larva, or caterpillar. And the pupa is what we usually call it if it's a moth. And a chrysalis is what we usually call it if it's a butterfly. They're really the same thing, as you will see. And then the adults are the, are the parent, you know, moth or the butterfly, the one that we really think are usually pretty, pretty nice. So I'm going to show you a little bit about our favorite butterfly in Michigan. Does anybody know what that one is? The monarch, the monarch butterfly. And its scientific name is Danius plexippus. And I just have a few slides I'm going to show you just to review the life cycle and to show you what they do in each stage, and then we're going to get to what a real butterfly or a real moth is all about. So we good? No questions yet? Okay, all right, so we're gonna turn off a couple lights here and show you a few slides. All right, now this is a, what we call a first instar. I have no idea why they actually stuck with that name, but it's a first instar, it's a first stage of the monarch butterfly, the first caterpillar, that hatches out of this little egg. And you can see the egg here has got all these little scallop things. It's very small, but you can find them on milkweed here uh, from May through September, actually, in Michigan. And the first thing this little caterpillar does, since it's got mandibles, you know, like us almost, is it chews this egg down after it emerges. And then it goes over here to the leaf and it kind of just eats out a little bit of the leaf over here. Then it sits and then it eats again. But basically all it really does is eat. So it eats and it eats and it eats. And finally, its exoskeleton is so tight that it can't grow any further. So it needs to chemically kind of devour the old exoskeleton, and then it's going to build a new one underneath it. So this is what it looks like. This is how fast they go. Here's the first instar, and then second, third, fourth, and fifth. And by the time it gets to this one here, it's about a thousand times more than what it weighed when it was this little tiny guy right here. 
And how fast does that happen? Does anybody know? Go ahead. So you think it takes about a week to get that far? Okay. Yes? A week too? An hour? Yeah, that's a little fast. <laughs> yes? A week and a half. Well, it actually, under really good warm temperatures, it really goes fast. So usually a couple weeks from egg to this huge caterpillar, and then it's molted, you know, several times, right? Shed its skin, and now it's got to make a pupa, only we call the pupa of a butterfly a chrysalis, which means a colored one. A pupa means like a little doll. So it, it hangs upside down, and right there it attaches itself with this little button of silk, and then it hangs down in this J shape like this, and all the insides are being kind of liquefied. And then there's certain cells that are in certain locations where the true legs will form and the true wings will form. And they have genes that say, OK, once we're a chrysalis, we're going to make these wings, we're going to make these legs, or whatever other parts it's going to make. Which is kind of phenomenal, isn't it? I mean, just think, just a couple weeks, maybe three weeks if the weather's a little colder, and you go from an egg to something like this. Now, how many of us do that? We take like 20 years, don't we, of slow growth and all this schooling, and we never hang upside down. Although I heard from yoga that it's pretty good practice, so we should try that. But here's the chrysalis. It's really pretty. Now remember, I, I talked to you about the Frederick Meyer Garden coming to uh, with their butterflies, their blooming exhibit very shortly. Well, they will have chrysalids like this, chrysalides, that will have these beautiful colors on them. And some of them in the same group that monarchs are related to are coppery color or almost gold. They're beautiful. And these colors disappear as soon as the butterfly emerges. And here's what they look like when they're hanging. Now, some of, some of us have seen these already, but I want to point out one right here. See this one emerging right now? Notice he's pulling his legs out, right? And right there, you can't see it real well, but there are two legs, they look like legs, but they're long tubes, and they're going to put those tubes together to make a proboscis. And with that proboscis, they're going to use to suck up nectar. These wings are little tiny things. You can see them right through the cuticle of this uh, chrysalis here. And they emerge, and within five minutes, they pump blood into these wings and blow them up like a balloon. And then they harden. They really don't dry because they're really not wet. But they do harden chemically, and it takes two or three hours before the monarch can actually fly. So it's job number one. If it doesn't put its tongue together, its proboscis, it can't feed, and so it doesn't live very long. OK, now, we're going to turn the lights on again. Thank you, Ricky. And we're going to sneak over here. I want to show you one that didn't make it. I'm going to pass these around so you can see. Now you can hold the cup just like this, but see, this one got stuck. We don't know if it was because it had a bad diet or because it was weak because of a bacterial infection, but it didn't make it. Now it's perfectly dry. It's been this way for four or five years. I forgot how long I've actually had this. But you can look at the body. It's stuck in its pupil case, right? Can't make it, so it couldn't expand its wings. And let's see if anybody can tell if it's a male or a female. You can, just, you can just hang it right there and just pass it around. What do you think? Don't know. It's hard to tell. There's a black dot on the hind wing if it's a male. And if it's not a male, it won't have that black dot. Anybody see it? Don't see it? It's on the top of the back wing. Now we're going to have a whole, a whole session just on monarch migrations in the spring because they come back from Mexico. And I just heard that um, you know, they've had a lot of rain down there. Just yesterday I was watching the Spanish stations and they had a lot of rain in Michoacan, which is virtually the same name state down there as Michigan is up here. They even sound alike. 
but they've had terrible times down there with flash floods, so that is not good for our monarchs. They roost up there at 10,000 feet. That's almost, well, almost two miles up. And so when they get wet, and then if it gets cold, they freeze, and that's when they die by the millions. So we're hoping that it doesn't get too cold. Yes? They roost at 10,000 feet? 10,000 feet in these huge uh, fir trees and these false white pine trees up there by the millions. Almost, yeah, it seems like it's in the stratosphere. Not quite, but. So, that is a male, and that male didn't make it. And that happens all the time. So you can imagine, you're a good egg, you molt five times, and you become a chrysalis, and then you're a butterfly, and then something happens, right? Like you just happen to emerge next to a hungry spider, or maybe who knows, you just can't pull out of your chrysalis and therefore you can't expand, expand your wings and you don't make it. So it's kind of sad, but that's the way nature really is. We might have a billion monarchs every year that go down to Mexico, but maybe only 100, 150 million actually make it down there. And of those, not that many actually come back part way. So those are butterflies now, right? And you said egg, caterpillar, Chrysalis, adult, and that's the adult. Now, I've got a couple things I want to show you just to help you out with my quiz, and I want to show you some butterflies here. This one is from Central America, actually Southern Mexico too, so it's partly North America. This would be at the Frederick Meyer Garden. This is a morpho butterfly. It means beautiful or shapely. And it has an iridescence. Does anybody know what iridescence is? Go ahead. Very good. That's exactly what it is. You had an answer too? Oh, you're going to look at that one? Yeah, we'll get to that in just a minute. But so it's really shiny. If you hold it at different angles, it, it changes color a little bit, but not too much. And that's because the, this color is not a, a quote, end quote, real color. It's really, like you said, a shininess, kind of like oil on water or a screen that would make a really shiny, reflective color. Does anybody know why you might want this kind of color? This is a male butterfly, and if you look at the back, it's pretty ordinary, isn't it? Go ahead. It why does it? Blend in with trees. Oh, it could blend in with trees with that side and the blue side. How about that? To attract a mate. To attract a mate. Very good. Oh, to attract a mate. To attract a mate. Now the females are bright blue too, but they usually don't have as much blue there. So can you imagine, now just imagine, just do a thought experiment. You're in a rainforest, and it's pretty dark in a rainforest. It's kind of like a Michigan forest in the middle of summer, and you see flashes of blue. But as soon as it flashes, it closes up and you can't see it. And you're a hungry predator, and you're trying to find it, but it's blue over there, then it's blue over there, then it's blue over there. It's hard to follow, isn't it? They're very fast. They fly like this. They're just crazy flyers. So to actually get one of these is very difficult. Do you know how we catch these? They have one weakness. Stale beer and rotten bananas. They love that. And, you know, don't tell your parents this, but they take in too much alcohol and they get kind of tipsy so they fall over and you can just pick them up. So that's how we got these. And it tends to be more males than females. Don't ask me why. But that's usually what happens. Now, in our area here, we actually have butterflies pretty close related to this. They're called browns and satyrs. And they have the same underside as this, but they're not nearly as pretty. So there's like 80 species of these in South America. And some are almost as big as this, as this box over here, as the bottom part of this box. They're huge. They're eight inches wide this way. And they're bright blue. You've never seen anything so blue in your life. So that's one story, right? Now, here's another one from Mexico. I'll put this over. Actually, you know what? You guys could pass it around. It's, I think it's pretty well in here. And you can look at both sides. There you go. So grab it at the bottom there. Check it out. Here's another one. These are called kite swallowtails. We actually have one here in Grand Rapids that's very similar to this. It has two broods a year. See these long tails and these little eye spots right there? We think that that looks like a fake head, and lots of times when you catch these, you'll see scissor marks right there. Does anybody know what causes the scissor marks? The predators, they think it eats the head, so they're going to 
Right, so they, they snip it, right? He just kind of says, oh. So do you think it's pretty difficult to find a butterfly of this with both tails? Yeah. yeah, it's very hard. These are so common in May in Mexico near the old ancient Mayan sites that you can't go down the road without killing hundreds of them in your car. They're just everywhere. They're like mosquitoes. So you can collect hundreds of these if you wanted to in a matter of 10 minutes, just swinging your net. Now, I didn't do that. I just wanted to bring enough back so I could show my zoology students over here at Grand Amphis Community College. So this is kind of a cool butterfly. I'll pass this around. You can look underneath there. It looks like a, kind of like a zebra almost. Now that one doesn't fly very fast. Yes, do you have a question? That's exactly what it is. Sometimes, like, they can scare chipmunks by when they're closing. And, like, the chipmunks are just sneaking up, and then it will open, and it looks like right. big, boogly eyes. Right. And we're going to see some of those in just a minute here. But here's one that's related to it, another kite swallowtail. Only this one is almost impossible to catch. Those are easy. I don't know why it's like that, but these are much rarer than those over here. These have... These are like cabbage butterflies, you know, they're the white ones you see up here in Michigan. And these are not nearly so common, and they fly so fast. You think everything in the tropics flies fast. That's what you eventually decide when you're trying to collect butterflies. So this is a very pretty one, too. And I'll show you this, and you can see that it's similar to that one. Now, how do you know these are butterflies? Maybe I'm just telling you a story, making this up. How do I know they're butterflies? Go ahead. That's okay. <clears throat> Butterflies have scaly wings. Scaly wings, okay. And moths are more hairy. Hairier, you think? Okay. And they have clubbed antenna. They have clubbed antenna and, and the moths don't? No, they have furry antenna. Furry antenna, okay. And moths have really gigantic eyes. They have big eyes on them, okay. And you remembered what you were going to say? Like the body would maybe like bigger than like Okay. So we're talking about a little chubbier, right? A little hairier. And they have clubbed antenna. Or they don't have clubbed antenna if they're a moth, right? They have feelers, you know, with the feathery ones. Okay. So now we need to see if that's true, right? Because we're going to test to see if that's true. And I, I brought some butterflies and maybe some moths up here. I'm not exactly sure. You guys can help me decide, right? Okay. So we have a frame of Lepidoptera, because that's the group we're with, right? That's the order. So we have here, based on what you guys said, I'm thinking that's a butterfly? Or? Yeah? No? It's got clubbed antenna. Butterfly? How about this one? It's hairier, but it's got clubbed antenna. Mm, it's kind of hard, isn't it? That one right there. Think that one's a moth? Who thinks that's a moth? So about half of you, right? And the other one thinks they're, they're butterflies? OK. This one, you think? Butterfly or moth? Butterfly. This one? Moth. Well, it looks just like that one. This one's the butterfly? This one's the moth? Okay, how about this one? Butterfly. Butterfly. How about how about these little ones, these transparent ones? Butterfly. And this one? Moth. This one? Um, butterfly. Butterfly. This one's like the other one. How about this one? Moth. And this one? And this one? That's a moth. moth. Everyone agree that's a moth? Okay, this one? It kind of looks like that one almost, doesn't it? Except it's got the colors reversed. How about this one? Butterfly. And this one? Butterfly. Okay, so should we look at them and see? Okay, this one is a butterfly. This one is a uh, moth. <laughs> this one is a butterfly. This one is a moth. 
And I want you to notice down here, here's a moth too, but look, they mimic each other. And in Brazil, where these were found, and over here too, they are mimics. So they are flying together. Guess what they taste like? Terrible, right? Just like your face has just showed me. They're terrible. And they can make you very sick. They feed on different plants, but now look, if you saw this flying, it would be hard to see what the difference is, right? So, and the rest of these things, as far as I know, are butterflies except that one. That is a moth related to this one up here. But I'm going to show you a butterfly in a little bit that looks just like that. And I don't know if it's in a, a mimicry complex where we know that they all taste bad and so they're, you know, not going to eat them. I don't know. So we did pretty good, maybe 80%, right? Is that good? Okay, now let's go to another exam, right, because we have to learn this stuff. Here's another group here, right? Can everybody see those? Yeah. Butterfly. Butterfly. Moth. Moth. Butterfly. 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 It's got a chubby body and it's hairy. It's a butterfly. It's got the club's antenna though. Well, so did that one. Oh, my gosh. Butterfly. 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 This one, this one? Moth and butterfly. And then this one? Butterfly. This one? Butterfly. This one? Butterfly. This one? You know the name of this one? It's called the Black Witch. And there are white witches that are even bigger than this. And this one sometimes migrates all the way up from Mexico to Michigan in the middle of the summer. And when lepidopterists, the people who study butterflies, see one, they just go crazy. It's like, you know, it's all the holidays rolled into one. Because they don't come up here very often. What's this one? That's a bee. Wait a minute. I thought this was about butterflies and moths. It's a moth? How do you know that's a bee? Oh, I thought bees had four wings. No. Plus, it's got one yeah, I think they do. They? Yeah, they oh. do. Oh. You want to know what it is? It's a fly. It's a fly. <laughs> yes, it's a fly that actually will eat little butterflies. And you can tell, I'll show you how you can tell. See how skinny the body is? It looks like it should be a lot bigger for a bee, right? It's really skinny, so it's a mimic. Just like those butterflies were. This is a mimic. And isn't that creepy? This is sitting on my front porch and I was looking at it and I thought, why is that bee not moving? And I thought, oh my gosh, it's not a bee, it's one of those flies. And they're very fast and they're very cool because they're they've got the same colors, but if you look at the antenna, just look at those antenna. <laughs> See they're tiny. And bees have like a little notch in them, right? But there are moths that look like this, too, and I'm going to show them to you later on, and then I want you to remember that you saw this, okay? So these are all butterflies down here. Of course, you saw that one. So we're getting there, aren't we? We're, we're kind of understanding what this is all about, right? So I'll pass this around. You can just hold it like this in the frame if you want to look. Maybe I'll do this side first because you guys always get last, right? So you guys look over there. I'll put these over here for a minute, okay? All right, now... Sometimes we saw these guys look alike, right? And we called them mimics. Usually there was a model that was really bad tasting and sometimes a mimic that was either good or bad tasting mimicking the model. Sort of like if you were a real tough guy and he dressed just like you, I wouldn't be able to tell you guys apart, right? You have the same color clothes on. Yes? These are all mimics. Oh, very good. You think those are? Most of these are found in Michigan. A few are tropical or subtropical down here, but most of these are found in Michigan or somewhere near us. And these are virtually all of them are called fritillaries or fritillaries. Now, how many species do you think there are here? How many different types? Go ahead. Yep. About 15, maybe? 15? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't think I've got 50 in there. Quite a few, right? Maybe that many. How many do you think I have? I'd say more like 20. 20, okay. Around 15, maybe. 15, maybe? About 
Okay, so how would you tell them apart? What would you use? Would you look at some of these? I'll pass it around. They all seem orange and dark to me. It's a mystery, isn't it? Are the differences between them? Oh, and they have silver underneath. Is that iridescence, that silver? It's kind of like that, isn't it? Shiny, silver. Okay, go ahead. They've got different patterns. Different patterns. Is it hard to tell the patterns apart? Yes. Yes, it's very hard. People go crazy over this group. I'm not an expert in this group, but you know, they have all sorts of what we call subspecies, where it looks like this, but it's a little different, you know, it's, it's crazy. Well, here's another one. Look at this. Those are wings. Yeah. Now, let's say you're in the tropics and you found a bunch of wings underneath a spider web. And you were trying to identify what they were. How would you do it? Go ahead. Okay. So you'd use a character. Go ahead. Um, like some are larger or more round. And others are thinner. Okay. Do you think there could be differences between males and females, though, maybe? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Could these be mimics? Could they be all kinds of different species? Or could they all be one species? Because we like to think of variation, like with humans, right? Everybody looks different, but we all know we're human, right? Could that be possible here, too? It's very difficult to tell, though, isn't it? Because you see these little differences, like my students in zoology notice that, well, some of these are, are bright yellow up here, and some of them are kind of smudgy yellow, and some have their wings split into two yellow spots. So maybe you want to call them a different species, right? You see how hard this is? So let's say you find something new in the tropics. And it looks like this, and you have to classify it. You have to put it in the tree of life. It's not easy. Sometimes it takes a year to do that, because you have to look at the life history. What kind of eggs does it lay? What does a caterpillar look like? Right? It's very difficult. Yes? You could look at it in ultraviolet. Oh, what would that do? We didn't even bring that up. I'm going to pass that to you so you can look at it. What would the ultraviolet do? It would make the colors like totally different. Yes, it would, because those scales would absorb differently in ultraviolet light. And butterflies can see ultraviolet. So the morpho that I showed you, this one right here, not only does it look iridescent in blue, because the blue wavelengths are reinforced, but also if I put a UV light on here, it'll look different too. So we think in the tropics that Butterflies that live in the forest also use ultraviolet reflectance. It looks, really, it looks like a mirror. So when these things are flying in the woods, you know, in the, in the rainforest or wherever they're flying, you see these bright flashes of blue, or you can also see the ultraviolet. If you can see ultraviolet. Can you guys see ultraviolet? No. no. Why not? Because we don't have the right kind of light or something. Yeah, the, the back and the eye, the receptors, we, we don't have it, do we? So we just can't see ultraviolet at all. But these butterflies can, and that sometimes is the only difference between something that looks alike to us, like yellow, and something that is very shiny and ultraviolet. So the butterflies would know, right? Yeah. But do we know? No. No, we wouldn't know really what it's all about. Well, here's another one. This is kind of a cool one. So I'm going to open this one up. Now, we, sh we looked at... We looked at monarch butterflies, remember? And we said the males have a black dot on the hind wing and the females don't. But there's also mimicry even in areas like Michigan. So here we go. Can you see this? Now this is pretty strange. Here's the monarchs. You know they taste bad because they eat milkweed. This is a viceroy. It's not too bad. I mean, you can eat it. I've actually seen birds eat viceroys. They, they feed on willows and things like that. They're a little bad tasting. But they mimic the monarch, we think, up here. But the kissing cousin to the viceroy is this one. Now, is that the same color? No. What color is it? Blue. Yeah, and it's iridescent, isn't it? Does it look like the same? 
You see that underground underside there? Isn't that pretty? Okay, now kind of remember that for a second. Okay, I'll put this back. Do you see any patterns that are the same there? Yeah. You can actually mate these together, and we have hybrids, we call them, in the field. You can catch them, and they're kind of like this underneath, and they're kind of purplish orange on the top. So they're very close related. And yet this one is flying with monarchs up here. And this one, we think, is flying as a mimic of this one down here. Now, it doesn't always work out that way, but it's a good story. So this one here is a swallowtail that is terrible tasting. It's probably worse than the monarch if you were to eat it. And then we have three different, well, three different swallowtails I put here that actually are mimicking this and they're perfectly edible. You guys could eat these and you would be okay. I don't know if you'd want to, but when they're flying, you can't tell them apart. So there's one complex here, and then there's a kissing cousin over here that's in another complex. So it's really kind of strange, isn't it? But this is for protection. Now, they don't evolve because they want protection. It just kind of happens that way. So these are Michigan ones. I'll pass this around on your side for now, okay? All right. Now, we know what butterflies are now, right? Usually clubbed antenna, well, clubbed antenna. Are they pretty? Usually, but not always. Are they hairy sometimes? Sometimes they're hairy, but a lot of times. There's a beautiful one here called the morning cloak. It's beautiful, but it's very hairy. And then there's skipper butterflies. I didn't even bring those out here, but they're chubbier bodies, and they fly in the daytime, because typically we think butterflies fly in the daytime, right? Now, do any moths fly in the daytime? Some. Well, these up here did, right? Because if they didn't fly in the daytime, they wouldn't be mimicking these guys. So they're day flying tiger moths. They look just like them. Yes? But like some of the fuzzy moths, like they will fly at night. They fly at night. Usually the bigger they ones fly, fly at, at night. night. Right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get some, some things over here that are called giant silk moths. And then I have, who is going to cut open the pupa now? I mean, cut open the uh, uh, cocoon? You were going to do one. Well, look. I'll put this aside for a minute. And this over here, these, these right here are all moths that are found east of the Rocky Mountains. But all of these here are found in Michigan. All these here. Now, how many different species do you think are here? Go ahead. Five. Five. Looks like five, doesn't it? And I'll hold this up for you guys so you can see all of it. Looks like five species. Okay, so... Um, I got some stories to tell you, because you probably know some of these moths, right? This is the polyphemus moth right here. Has anybody ever seen this up north, maybe? No, have you seen them on your screens, maybe at your cottage or wherever? And this one is Cecropia. It's the biggest one we've got. And this is a small one. Sometimes they get almost eight inches. They're, just, they're like big as a bat. And they fly kind of like a bat, too. And then there's this one that's a Orizaba. It's a silk moth that I got from Texas. I actually reared these on, on um, peanut butter and another mix that I made from leaves, and they ate it, and they all grew into these beautiful moths here. But these are transparent. You see the windows? Yeah. Right? And you can kind of tell that they're related because these windows kind of match these little lunules over here, don't they? They're in the same spot, but they're clear. Now, these are the same species. This is a male, this is the female, this one flies in the daytime, and this one sits there until it's mated. So the females, when they emerge, wait for males to mate with them. And they do that by putting, putting out this special perfume called a pheromone. And it can, they can attract males from six or seven miles away. So the males have these huge antenna, and I was going to show you an antenna here. These big furry ones right here, you see these right here? This is a female's antenna. This is a male of a Cecropia. This is a male of a Polyphemus. It's even bigger. So I'll pass around. You guys can look at that. But look, they're like, they're like feathers, right? What do you think's on those feathers? Like sensors? Like sensors, exactly. There's sensors all over the place, and they can pick up one molecule for every million in the air. 
That's pretty sensitive, right? That's a lot more sensitive than I can do. So those are pretty cool. You can tell male from female of these big moths by looking at them. Now, I got a question for you. How long do you think this thing lives? Um, maybe like 30 years. 30 years? Think about 20 days. 20 days? A couple months. Couple months? Two or three days. Two or three days. So who do you think's right? Two or three days? That's actually pretty close. In a week, these guys are all dead. You know why they're all dead? They can't feed. They don't have any mouth parts anymore. Or the mouth parts are so small they can't function. So they don't have a proboscis. Doesn't that mean you have to store up all your food as a caterpillar? And then when you're born, you got a big chunky body like that, right? And so when you're flying, try to find, you know, the female, you don't have any time to waste, do you? You have to smell the, the pheromone out there and go right to the female and mate. And you mate for a whole day, and then you lay maybe a thousand eggs. You know how big these eggs are? They're easy to see. They're bigger than the head of a pin, much bigger than these pins here, but they're pretty big size. But they don't live very long. They're really just kind of ways of getting the species to distribute itself around, you know, wherever it is. So they might go miles laying eggs, and they're not very careful. They simply land on something, they lay eggs, and they land on another plant, lay more eggs. And so these species here aren't really too fickle about the plants that they lay their eggs on. There might be two dozen species of plants these guys will lay their eggs on. The monarch only lays it on one, the milkweeds, right? These might be maples, they might be oaks, they might be willows, could be any number of different ones. But they don't feed. So remember that when I get to my next group here. Now, are you guys getting hungry? Okay, I've got something for you. So you just hang on here, all right? Um, I figured you'd be getting hungry. So I prepared this in advance. Okay. Little snack. So here, go ahead, pass it around. One per person. Maybe I don't have enough. I don't know. I hope I have enough. But yeah, help. And you guys got to tell me the name of that before you actually, you want to eat these or no? Oh, you don't want to eat them? You're not that hungry? Okay. Oh, okay. So you don't want to do that? <laughs> You're not too hungry anymore? I'm not hungry. You wouldn't eat a moth? Look at the size of those bodies, you guys. You want one? All right. Now, since you don't want to eat them, I think, if you don't want to eat them, you should tell me what kind of moth it is and if it's a male or a female by looking at the antenna. Now, some of you don't have antenna on yours because they broke off, but maybe the females are a little bigger than the males. What do you think? Thanks. What do you think? That one? Okay. Well, this one might, this one's got real thin antenna. That's pretty heavy, see? Where's that one little thing here? Let's use this as our guide. See, this thing here um, looks pretty thin on this one. This might be a female, and maybe that's a male, you think? So you don't have to eat yours. Okay. Did you guys figure yours out? You think it's a female? Is it a big body or small? Okay, all right. How about this one here? I have a, male, a female, that one. Okay, I would say you do. See how big that body is? Mm -hmm. That's good. How about this one over here? I think I have a female. You think that's a female? I might be a little hairier than that, so there's the male. That might be a male on that one. How about you? I think mine's a male. Okay, that looks good. Female, and that one over there? Did you get that one? You can pick them up, it's okay. <laughs> Do you think these taste very good? Yes. You know what? I gotta tell you that there are Native Americans who used to put caterpillars very much like these on a stick and they'd roast them over the fire like you roast a marshmallow. 
So no. they don't, didn't call them s'mores back then, they called them smatterpillars or something like that, I don't know, if they had chocolate. But these are big, aren't they? Yeah. You can almost make an omelet out of their eggs. Tasty. You know? So these are one of my favorite groups because here's another thing they do that's very interesting. You see how hairy they are? Yeah. Look how hairy they are. These things vibrate. When they're ready to take off, they, they vibrate like this. They go, shh. They look like they're really nervous. And they shake their wings. You know what they're doing? They're kind of like running the flight system. Yeah, that's what they're doing. But when they do that, they're contracting muscles, and the muscles generate a lot of heat. These can't fly well until they're about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, but usually they fly much warmer than that, 90 degrees. That's close to your body temperature. So when you see one of these take off, it, it shivers like this, and all of a sudden it goes whoosh, takes off when it gets warm enough. And if it's windy and cold, they have to land again. So they hope that they always find a female before they get too cold. Right? So these are giant silk moths, yes, and there's even bigger ones in the world. At the Meyer Garden, you see the atlas moth. Did you guys ever see the atlas moth there? They're huge, aren't they? So those are big too. Yes? Um, have you ever had a student who's actually ate in the moth? You know what? I have. Awesome. I, I had a guy who was in the Marines, and he was in California, and they do this life survival stuff up there in the mountains. He ate caterpillars, he ate cockroaches, he ate worms, he ate everything. And I, I had some pupa in a little tin from Korea. And I said, who wants to try some of these pupa? These are like these things here. And he raised his hand, no one else would raise their hand. And I said, they taste like peanut butter, they're not that bad. He said, I'll eat the whole thing. So he ate the whole can of pupa. And I know it sounds gross, but they're very nutritious because they're all what protein. Did he, say after he, was done? he said it tastes good. I mean, after all, he's a marine, he ate everything right? So, yeah, so you can eat them. I was going to pass this around too. This is a pupa inside because everyone calls the chrysalis of a butterfly a cocoon, but really the cocoon is hairy, right? It's made of silk. So if you look inside here, you can actually see where the wings were and the antennas were. Here's the antenna coming down right there, and this would have been a female, and here's a wing case where the wings came out of. So I'll pass this around to you too. And then we have two people who volunteered to cut open the cocoons, right? So who was one? Was you were going to do one and you were going to do one. So do you, want, do you know how to do this? You don't want to do this now? I don't know how. Okay, you just take the scissors and you cut into it and you're going to find the pupa because the pupa is inside the cocoon, right? And this is a very small one. This came from a friend of mine. Do you want, to, you want her to do it first? Okay, you ready? You're not. You ready for this? Okay, and while you're doing that, I'll get some other things for you. Okay, so cut it open. Now you gotta kind of feel the pupa there. You can touch it, you can feel like this, look. You can feel it, it's inside. See, it's a baggy cocoon. Thanks. Did you get it? That's a good job. You see how tough that silk is? They tried to make these guys into producing silk, you know, but they were too hard to rear and they, and they were very delicate creatures. But the silk moths of Asia, they brought over here. Um, and obviously, you know, if you ever had silk clothes, they feel pretty good. They're very smooth, very soft. So this is like wild giant silk moth. <clears throat> you know, I think they had an industry in the East Coast for a while. I don't know if they still have that there. I think most of them come out of Asia now. Did you find it? Take it out. Uh oh, see, I think there's a problem. Houston. Right? You can use your fingers, it won't hurt you. Not every day you get to dissect a cocoon, huh? Oh, well, you know what? Look at that. Does that look like a pupa? No, the, 
Uh, I don't think it made it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that one made it. Something happened to it. So we better hope that the next one has one. Now, I'm thinking that this one is the lucky, lucky cocoon. I'm thinking that something happened to that when it tried to make a pupa, it couldn't molt properly, and so it dried up. Now, we're going to hope for the best. I think, you know how I always tell? This one rattles a little too much for me, too. I'm suspicious of this one, too. When I used to collect these with my brother, Paul, we would have, we would have tons of these. We would come home covered with mud up to our necks. I almost drowned in Reed's Lake once looking for cocoons. Do you want to cut this open? OK. So cut it open. Let's see if there's a pupa in there. If there's not, I've got another one to show you. Now, I don't know, obviously, because I've never cut it open before. But here you go, doctor. OK. This is like Christmas, isn't it? <laughs> now notice there's a big bag around a thinner bag, right? Some of these are really huge. I have seen cocoons that are as big as my hands. Whoa. Huge. And you know what eats them in the middle of winter? Mice. And I hated mice because, you know, we find the cocoon, we have to walk through a swamp to get to it, and then you take it off and there's a hole in it from a mouse or sometimes a blue jay. Yeah, so I wasn't very happy about those. Now see right there? You've got two layers now, right? You've got this outer layer made first, and now it's made this layer. Yep, you got to be real careful though, real careful. Yeah. There you go. Okay. I sure hope this is a live one. Alive? Alive? Yeah. Yeah, this will be alive. If it's alive, I'll show you what we can do with it. For dessert. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I get some more from Korea, what do you think? Is it open? <laughs> now, this is what my students do for three hours twice a week. They're very lucky because there's only 24 students in my class. You see? Let's see. Let's see. Oh, I don't know, you guys. You think? Oh, wait a minute. I have a feeling that is a beautiful pupa. Look. Now, I'm going to show it to you guys. It's nice. Look. Here's the face. I always call it the face. It's really not. But there's the antenna. There's the eyes that are going to be made. These are the little wings right there. See those little tiny wings? And this is the abdomen. Now, we would always tell if they're alive by shaking them if they were heavy. See? This is a little doll, a pupa. Isn't that kind of cool? Mm, yeah, so far. Huh. Yeah, it will emerge into a moth like this, a cecropia moth. So I'm going to pass this around. Don't be afraid. It's a little cool. In fact, if it's cool, that means it's alive. Did we, did we hurt it by cutting it? No, actually we didn't. What we're going to do is we're going to put it back in here later, and it, when it gets ready to emerge, I'm just going to take a little bit of glue and close it back up, mm -hmm. like a bad surgery. <laughs> and then when it emerges, it secretes a, a bunch of chemicals, enzymes, that open up the silk and it just crawls out, just like the monarch did, and it opens up its wings. So this is a small one. This is a baby. And it looks like it's a male. Males are usually smaller, because females do all the egg work, right? It's a very busy life. Yes? Um, how close do you think it is to uh, you know, if I keep this inside, it will emerge probably in April. If I had it outside, it would be June. So if you keep them inside, they usually emerge a little earlier than the ones outside. Now I got some other moss to show you, the last part of today. I'll put this back in here. And the close relatives of this moth, it's one of my favorite groups as well. And I'll just bring these over here for a minute. But this is pretty cool. These, these are called sphinx moths, and they, some of them are huge. Look, here is a pupa, I'll pass this around first, of a sphinx moth. Now, you notice the difference. This one has like a little jug handle on it. What do you think grows in that jug handle? Go ahead. 
close. Oh, um, the little tongue mouth. The proboscis yeah. grows in there. Some of these moths in the tropics are, they have a proboscis almost 10 inches long. And I'm going to show you one that we have that's about five inches long. And they pollinate flowers you would think that have a very deep, right, nectar tube way down. So they hover. Remember, these don't feed, right? And these feed a lot. And they fly like, anybody ever seen one? They fly like hummingbirds. So a lot of people see these in their gardens late in the day. And they think those are hummingbirds out there, but they're not. They're these kinds of moths. Yeah. So I'm going to pass this around. You can see the wing cases here. You can see the antenna going down. Here's the eye. And this is all proboscis. See, he actually moved. Now, don't be afraid. He, it's OK. But if you want to see if he's alive, I always put them up here like this. This, when they're cold on your lip, you know they're good, right? So this is a live pupa. You guys can do that if you want. <laughs> All right. Who watched Avatar or Avatar? Okay. You remember the planet's name? Pandora. Pandora. We have a sphinx for you. The Pandora Sphinx. Do you want it? No. You want to look at it? Check it out. It's actually much prettier than this, but it's, these, these fade fast. Here, you can just grab that pin right there. There you go. And you can pass it around. Just don't stab yourself. So Pandora is a, a nice sized sphinx moth. Here's one that emerges that's related to our tobacco and tomato hornworm. It's in the same group. This flies about 180 to 100 beats per second. So it's bzzz, you know, like this, and it floats. And they can fly backwards, they can fly forwards. And you notice how, how thin the wings are compared to how chubby those wings are? So these things fly like gigantic airplanes. They're very clumsy flyers, but these guys, they see you coming. And I can tell you once when I was in Mexico with my brother, we hung up a sheet next to the car up in the Orizaba Mountains there, and we just had the headlights on. And these guys, their, their eyes turn red when they see it, so we could see thousands of moths coming at us from the distance. And then they would land on us, and I'll show you how big some of these are. And, you know, I liked butterflies and moths, but they actually hurt because they had these big, long spurs on their legs, and they would grab onto you. They would cover your whole T-shirt with moss, big moss. Not, this is a small one by comparison with some of the ones we found. So I'll pass this around to you now. You, this is sharp here, so grab it like that, and then you can pass the head on to somebody else. Look at the antenna. Very furry, right? Does that mean they fly at high temperatures, you think? Yeah, they fly at over 100 degrees. Whoa. Now, here's the thing I wanted to tell you. You see this one right here? This is the white line sphinx, this one. And this is the big one. This is the medium one. And this is the baby one, right? They're really not babies. They're all adults. But the ones that are small can fly in the daytime. And the ones that are big fly at nighttime. Does anybody know why? It could be that, right? Or? I was thinking it would be, since they're smaller, they could fly faster and they'd be harder to catch in daytime. Okay, and one other thing. The smaller you are, the quicker you lose your body temperature, the heat from your body. So these guys have to fly at over 90 degrees Fahrenheit, very close to your body temperature, sometimes 100. So the little ones can fly in the daytime, and these can't. Now, with that information, you have a question, though. Um, about Pandora. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's Pandora's box. Yes. So we named that moth after Pandora's. Now, here's one here. Remember that, that fly that you guys told me was a bee? Remember that? Yeah. Doesn't that look kind of like a bee? Yeah. Uh, I know it's only got half the wings, but... You notice it's got four wings, or would have four wings, right? Yeah. And it's got knobbed antenna. Oh, that can't be a moth, can it? But it is. It's a moth. So grab that. That flies really warm, too, and it does mimic bees. And if you catch them with your hand, do you know what they try to do? What? They act like they're trying to sting you. Now, 
That's what I think they're doing, because they buzz like crazy, and they move their abdomen down, but guess what? They don't have a stinger. <laughs> so they're all fakes all the way around, right? So we have this moth mimicking a bee. We have a fly mimicking a bee. It's a crazy world. How about this one here? This is a very unusual one. It, well, you, well, it flies very fast, and if it, if it was in your hand, it would definitely try to get out. So if you opened your hand up, it would be gone. But my daughter, Maddie, she, she um, catches these things, or she used to, probably not now, but she used to. Now this one is very hairy. Can you see the hair on there? Yeah. And it's very tiny, but if you're very tiny and you wear a very warm coat, you can stay very warm, can't you? So this one flies in January and February in California, high up in the mountains where it's foggy all the time, and it's very cool there. This is a very unique hawk moth, and it's one of my favorites because the, the hair on here is so thick, it's like a really nice fur coat. It's even better than the other ones. You got that one? So this one is really kind of neat, and here's one. Somebody told me about some moths that open their wings, and they have an eye spot. We have big ones like that. This one rests, this is a hawk moth, that rests with the wings over the eye spots, and if you touch it, it goes, opens its wings, and it, it, it scares you, because you think, oh, those are eyes. It's a much bigger creature, right? You see the eye spots over here? Yeah. Um. Well, that's, its, that's sort of a relative in a way, but its wings fold over the eye spots too, and when somebody touches it, it opens it up. Look at those big eyes. Wouldn't that scare you? And if it doesn't scare you, here's what they do. They flop on the ground, and they flap, and they flap, and they flap. Like, you know, they can't control themselves. So it looks like something, that, you know, you don't want to eat. So I have seen birds look at them like this, and then they just kind of walk away and fly away to something else. They get confused. Now I've got one other, a couple other frames to show you. I want to show you how diverse this sphingid group is. There might be 150 species, maybe 200. I don't really know. But look, <clears throat> here's some. Many of these are in our own area here in Michigan. Here's Pandora's over here. Here's the white lion sphinx. There's all sorts of species of these things. They're very diverse. But you probably have never seen these, have you? Anybody ever seen these? Because most of them fly at night. The only ones that don't fly at night are these little tiny ones like this. And they're the only ones that can fly in the daytime because they will not overheat. These big guys here. When they fly in the daytime, they get too hot and they have to stop. So they're strictly in the, in the nighttime. Here, I'll put this over here. There we go. Thank you. So put that there. Now I've got a couple more here. Look at these. Remember I was telling you about the tongue? Yes. See that tongue? Whoa. That's related to the one we opened up. That's pretty long, isn't it? So if you're flying over a flower, you just drop your tongue all the way down. You suck up the nectar, and then you go to the next one, you unroll your tongue. You see why it's so important to make sure that tongue is straight the first time? Yeah. If it's not straight and it has a little gap on the end, what's going to happen? Mm. Go ahead. <laughs> it's like a bad straw, isn't it? Do you ever have a bad straw that's got a hole in it? You can't take anything up, so you don't live very long. I'll pass this one around. You can look at the tongue there. Remember, that's the first thing they put together. And these guys live in the ground. You got it? These guys live in the ground, by the way, so the caterpillar, the caterpillar, when it's getting ready to make a pupa, it actually tunnels under the ground four, five, six inches below the frost line. And it makes a nest down there, sometimes a little bit lined with silk. But you see this right here? Here, touch that. No, just, yeah. Is that sharp? You want to touch it? Yeah. And when, go ahead. Here, I'll pass it to you. You guys can touch it. It won't hurt it. In the springtime, when the, when the soil gets really moist and, you know, gets uh, more air in it, it uses that end of the abdomen to go like this. It acts like a little shovel. And then it pops out on the surface, and then the moth comes out. Isn't that weird? They go down six inches. They make a pupa, not really a cocoon. And then in the spring, they better have a good shovel on the end, right, to dig out. So you think maybe sometimes they don't dig out, right? Yes? Um, like, the big moths, do, you, do they live longer if like, they're not 
Oh, that's a good question. These moths here, they live a pretty long time. They can live up to a month. Those guys, less than a week. But these guys feed on nectar, so they can live sometimes much longer than that. And they're very sturdy moths, very good flyers. So these are more different species of, of hawk moths. We have a lot of them here in Michigan. We're very lucky. Here, I'll pass this to you. You got it? And I'll close this one over here. And then the last one, these are the moths I was telling you about in Mexico. Now, can you imagine all these moths this size coming at you? They weigh, you know, four or five grams. It's a lot. They hit you, and then they crawl on you, and they've got these spikes, these claws on their legs. And they dig in, and it's like, it really hurts. So at first, I thought it would be pretty cool, you know, because I have a white t-shirt, and we did this just for these moths. And there were so many, we couldn't possibly count them all. They covered the car. They covered the sheet. They covered our bodies with all these things here. So we finally turned the lights off because we had so many. But that's the difference between the tropics and up here, is when you find butterflies or moths in the tropics, you find thousands of them sometimes. If you go along the river, like the Amazon, you find muddy areas of the Amazon, sometimes you can find three or 4,000 species, or not species, but butterflies on the mud flats. They're taking up salts from those, those mud flats. So these are big. And they have very long tongues, you think, or very short tongues? Very, very long tongues. So, I think I kind of covered everything. I'm not sure. But let me just summarize a little bit, okay? This whole group is called Lepidoptera, right? And most of the Lepidoptera are moths. But there's a small group of day fly moths we call butterflies. So, if you go to Mexico, where I have friends and relatives, they will call them mariposas de la noche and del dia. In other words, butterflies of the day and butterflies of the night. They don't really distinguish them. And a lot of other cultures don't do that either because they all have scales on their wings, right? They're scaly winged creatures. They may or may not feed. They might be pretty. They might be ugly. They might be moss. They might be butterflies. Some of the most beautiful lepidoptera are moss. They look like the swallowtails that we have. So it's hard to tell unless you look at all the body things for them. These are easy to tell though, right? It's moths. They're big, they're hairy, and well, they're drabber than the butterflies. So any questions, you think? Last questions? Okay, you guys didn't eat your dinner. You're not going to do that? You're going to pass on that? You're going to eat it? <laughs> I don't, I don't think I'd advise you actually to eat that. But I hope you enjoyed it today, and next time we meet, we'll have another uh, professor who will be doing something a little different. I don't know exactly what that'll be yet. It might be chemistry, and uh, I think that'll be a lot of fun because we're going to start integrating things in. So you can see that with every boutique that we do, everybody has a specialty. And so we are specialists, but we don't know everything. Right? And some of the things I say today, they may change tomorrow. You just don't know in science. And that's good, right? That's very, very good. So I want to thank you guys from Stepping Stones Monastery for being here, and teachers, and moms, and Ricky. And we'll do this again next time. Well, you're welcome. It's fine. Thank you. Okay.